Well, welcome to worship, Oak Hills Church family. I am so pumped that you are joining us for our online service today. We have just a few minutes before service gets started. And so I want to welcome all of our new uh, members who are watching online with us for the very first time. We are so excited that you're with us today. And we hope that you have had an awesome Christmas with family and loved ones Actually, we are, in, we are live in the chat right now. So if you would, would you let us know how your Christmas day went uh, with family, um, with friends, with loved ones? We want to know uh, if it was a time of celebration and joy for you. Maybe some of you out there, maybe it wasn't the best Christmas this year. Maybe 2020 for you wasn't the best Christmas. We would love to just pray for you and with you. So if you would comment that in the chat as right now. We would love to just spend some time in prayer with you. And if you're new and and you're looking to get connected with us, we would love to do that with you. Simply just text the words CONNECT to 210-585-2585. One of our team members will gladly reach out to you and answer any questions you have in regards to OHC. It would be our honor to connect with you. Well, one of our values here at Oak Hills Church is persistent prayer. And we love praying for you and over you. Our staff, our elders, our prayer ministers are always praying over every single prayer request that you send in uh, daily. And so, Daniela, we are praying for the healing of your parents in Romania. Barbara. We are praying for your best friend as she undergoes surgery. And we're praying that God's spirit continually reminds us all that our father loves us and he is near to those who call on to him. We would love to pray for you. Uh, So all you have to do is text the words pray to 210-585-2585. And let's just continue to do what Jesus did and always go to the father in prayer. Well, we are getting ready to start worship. And so if you would, grab your family, grab your friends, and uh, gather around the the couch, gather around the living room, and let's get ready to open our hearts, our minds, our souls for worship. Worship the King. Let's worship. Welcome to Oak Hills Church. Let's give glory to God as we adore him with our worship. Amen.
used to come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come all you sinners, come find his mercy. Come to the table, he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for. Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king. Behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. wise men. The human race continues to search for a savior, someone to believe in and to follow. And I'm here to tell you today, look no further. Jesus is that answer. He's our hope 
of glory. So let's continue to bring our gift of worship. When the sea is calm and all is right, when I feel your favor flood my life, even in the good, I'll follow you. Even in the good, I'll follow you. When the boat is tossed upon the waves, when I wonder if you keep me safe, even in the storms, I'll follow you. Even in the storms, I'll follow you. I believe everything that you say you are. I believe and I see your unchanging heart in the good things and in the hardest part. I believe and I will follow you. I believe and I will follow you. And when I see the wicked prospering, when I feel I have no voice to sing, even in the ones I follow you, even in the ones I follow. I believe everything that you say you are. I believe and I see your unchanging heart in the good things and in the hardest part. Oh, I believe and I will follow you. I believe and I will follow you. And when I find myself so far from home, and you lead me somewhere that I don't want to go. Even in my death, I'll follow you. Even in my death, I'll follow you. When I come to win this race I've run, and I receive the prize that Christ has won, I will be with you. you say you are. I believe and I see your unchanging heart in the good things and in the hardest part. Oh, I believe in good things and in the hardest part. Oh, I believe and I will follow you. Oh, I believe and I will follow you. church said amen amen and amen well over the past few weeks many of you have partnered with us in prayer as we look ahead to 2021 and we just want to say thank you thank you for your commitment thank you for partnering with us in prayer as we as we set out to engage our culture with the hope of Jesus where we live work learn and, and play and God has given us three areas of focus going into 2021. The first one being we want to share the hope of Jesus. We want to reach people with the good news about Jesus, that Jesus still saves. And we can put our hope in him. 
Second, we want to make disciples. It's who we are. We are disciples who make disciples by guiding all people to follow Jesus moment by moment. And third, we want to prepare for the future. You know, following Jesus is is quite an adventure. And we believe God has given us some amazing opportunities as we turn the corner into 2021. So as we prepare for the year ahead, would you partner with us to bring the hope of Jesus to our community and to our world? And when you say yes to giving toward the work of Oak Hills Church through our year-end offering, we will be ready to say yes to sharing hope, making disciples, and preparing for our future. And giving is simple and just takes a few moments. You can give now through our app or simply scan the QR code with your phone and a notification will display a link to give. And you can also text Oak Hills, the word Oak Hills, to 77977. If you're a regular giver here at Oak Hills Church, we want to say thank you for your continued faithful generosity. We cannot build God's kingdom without you. If you've never given before, we want to thank you for being committed to being a part of the family here at Oak Hills Church. But we would also encourage you to take a bold step of faith and give towards the work of the ministry here at Oak Hills Church. You know, giving makes us look a lot like Jesus, our Savior. So would you pray and consider saying yes to giving towards our year-end offering? Well, church, prepare yourselves as Jim Barker brings a message of hope to us today. Well, greetings, everyone visiting with us today. We are so glad that you're with us. My name is Jim Barker, um, and I'm uh, really looking forward to the time that we spend together here today. Um, I'm an elder here at Oak Hills Church. I have the privilege of serving here as an elder. And of this church, I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit, that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. That is, the mystery that has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but has now been manifested to you, his saints, to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among you, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And I proclaim him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom that I might present every man complete In Christ. And for this purpose also I labor, striving according to His power that mightily works within me. Though those words resonate deep within me, those are not my words. Uh, You've probably already guessed that. You've realized that those are words of the Apostle Paul, Paul's words of hope, of purpose, and of power written to the Colossian believers nearly 2,000 years ago. Here's our plan for our time together. We are going to unpack Paul's words of truth in Jesus. We will discover God's hope for our lives in Jesus, God's purpose for our lives in Jesus, and God's power for our lives in Jesus. So before we go any further, let us pray. Good Father, thank you for your Son and all that he means to our lives today. May we lay hold of your glorious hope for our lives in Christ, to live Christ-empowered lives full of meaning and purpose. And now, good Father, teach us through Paul's inspired words. In the name of your Son, we ask you. Are you ready? Are you ready to unpack Paul's words of hope? and of purpose and power for our lives, we'll begin with God's hope for our lives in Jesus. Paul writes, of this church, I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word 
of God. Paul writes that for the benefit of the believers at Colossae, he was called to fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. Something had been missing in the preaching of God's word that Paul was now going to make known. And what is that? Let's read on. That is the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but has now been manifested to his saints. The mystery hidden from the past ages and generations refers to God's hope for our lives in Jesus, yet to come as prophesied in the Old Testament scriptures. This is what Travis spoke of in the first of these Advent messages. Hope in Christ Jesus is coming. And then Matt spoke of how God's promised hope for our lives arrived as a newborn baby who grew up to live among us as one of us for 33 long years. Hope in Christ Jesus has come. Paul goes on to explain what he meant by the mystery that had been hidden from the past ages and generations, but has now been manifested to us. He writes, to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. God's hope for our lives in Christ Jesus was prophesied to come. God's hope for our lives in Christ Jesus has come. And now Paul expresses God's ultimate hope for our lives in Christ to fulfill God's holiest intention for your life and mine. And what is that? Christ in you, the hope of glory. <laughs> One day Max asked me, Jim, uh, what is the most meaningful passage of Scripture to you? I said, well, what's yours, Max? He says, well, actually, I was hoping that you would answer me first. But mine is Colossians 1.27, Christ in me, the hope of glory. I answered, mine too. What is it about God's truth in this verse that is so meaningful? Well, let's do what we all should do when we read our Bibles to engage God in a meaningful way in his written word. Let's ask some needed questions of this passage. When you read your Bibles, get in the habit of asking questions. Ask who, what, when, where, how, who's writing, who's being written to, what is the context in which this passage of Scripture is located. Ask where and when this passage was written. Ask what is the meaning of this passage to the people this passage was written to in their times then. Then ask what is the meaning of this passage to my life today in my times. Ask how can I apply this passage of Scripture to my life to live out God's glorious will for my life. Let's ask some questions about this crisp, brief, meaningful, seven-word passage of Scripture, Christ in you, the hope of glory. We'll begin with the questions of who and where. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Who? Well, there's Christ and there's us. Where? In us. Now just hold on a holy minute, folks. Is Paul actually declaring the creator Christ as he declared Christ to be in Colossians 1? Christ who is the image of the invisible God. Christ by whom all things have been created both in the heavens and on earth. Visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created by Christ and for Christ. He's before all things and in him the whole universe is held together. Is Paul actually declaring that our creator Christ has actually come to live in us? Unimaginably, yes. And if that's not hard enough to comprehend, and it should be, contemplate the exceedingly humbling process for God that was involved in making this a living reality in your life and mine. God's plan was a plan of progressive, humble descent. Christ, our creator, willingly chose to humble himself to become a fetus in a young woman's womb, to be born as a helpless baby into a brutal, 
harsh first century world with none of what we would call the modern conveniences of life. Our creator Christ Jesus would grow as a little boy just like all the other little boys to become a young man who would work long, hard days in a blue-collar job as a carpenter and stone mason. Christ, our creator, would willingly subject himself to the full effects of living in a fallen world full of oppression, hardship, bitter cold, sweltering heat, adversity, and strife. He would live a life of relative anonymity in a little backwater village in the remote hills of Galilee. And at the end of 33 years of living among us as one of us, facing all that we face and more, our creator Christ Jesus would further humble himself to give his life willingly to die an unjust, agonizing death on a cruel Roman cross for the forgiveness of our wrongs. He would then be buried in an earthen tomb. He would gloriously be raised from the dead to ascend to heaven and back to his father from whom he came. As John Donne, the poet, expressed it, "'Twas much that man was made like God before." Oh, but that God should be made like man? Much more. The whole humbling process was necessary to fulfill God's ultimate intention for your life and mine, as this verse expresses it. Divine humility, oh, can it be that you, O oh God, wouldst come for me, robed in human flesh to wear, leaving heaven's glory there, from your Father with whom you live to live with us your life to give. Divine humility, oh, can it be that you, oh God, would die for me, descending from heaven to earth to cross to grave, to dwell in my heart your life you gave. Divine humility, oh, can it be that you, oh God, would live in me? Divine humility, to you I come. Please make my heart your holy home. May my life be just like thine, for I am the branch and you the vine. This raises a question, doesn't it? Why? Why would our creator humble himself to do all of this? Because it's his nature to do so. Because God is love and this is what love does. Love himself gave himself for our eternal well-being, even at the cost of convenience or comfort or time or resources or effort or personal safety, even at the cost of his own life. God did all that he's done in Christ Jesus. Why? So that we might live fulfilled and fruitful lives to nourish the lives of others. Once again, as Paul declared it, Christ in you, the hope of glory. This raises another question, doesn't it? What is God's glorious hope for our lives in Christ? Well, let's be clear about this. God's glorious hope for our lives of, in Christ is not just glory in the there and then someday. No, no, no. Also, the, God's glorious hope for our lives in Christ is glorious lives today here and now, God intends for us to live glorious lives here and now because the glorious Christ lives in us to enliven our lives with his. You may have seen this illustration before, but it's so simple, it wouldn't hurt to see it again. And sometimes a simple physical illustration can help us to grasp a profound ethereal and abstract truth. This common lantern has no glory of its own without this battery in the lantern at its power source. And now it may look like a lantern. It may have all the physical attributes of a lantern. But it cannot be what a lantern is intended to be without this battery in the lantern. And even if this battery were to command this lantern to do what this lantern is intended to do and shine its light of glory, it can't. Ah, but what if the lantern, confessing its need, acknowledging its need, called out to the battery to come into the lantern to be what the lantern was intended to be? Ah, 
Now the lantern can be what the lantern was intended to be. Now the lantern can shine its light of glory for all to see and by which all can see. Christ in us, the hope of glory, the hope of living glorious lives for all to see and by which all can see the glory of the one who came to make our hearts his holy home. Let me ask you a question. When you received Christ into your life, why did your life change? Why did your thinking change along with your desires, your motives, your interests, and your behaviors to follow? Is it because you just decided to change your thinking and interests? No, you can't give yourself credit for that. Your life changed because Christ Jesus came to live in you, giving you his life, his love, his goodness, his interests, his desires, his motives. Your life was changed because a new someone came to live in you, making you new to the glorious changing of you. Indeed, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Amen? Consequently, what is God's glorious will for your life and mine as his Christ indwelt sons and daughters. Well, Paul expressed it this way in Ephesians 4. God wants us to grow up, to know the whole truth and tell it in love like Christ in everything. We take our lead from Christ who's the source of everything that we do. Well, this raises yet another question, doesn't it? What does it mean to be like Christ Jesus in everything? It means that we are to learn to live our lives as Jesus lived his, lived his to become like him. And what did that mean? It meant that Jesus lived his life as a glorious expression of his abiding relationship with his Father in thought and motive, expressed through all that he was, all that he said, and all that he did, in every relationship, circumstance, and task to the blessing and well-being of all whom his life touched. And we're here today because he did. And Jesus calls us to follow him moment by moment to do the same. This is what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. To be a disciple of Jesus means that we are to learn to live our lives as Jesus lived his, to become like him for the well-being of others. To be a disciple of Christ is to learn to live our lives as glorious expressions of our union with Christ in thought and in motive expressed through all that we are, all that we say and do in every relationship, circumstance, and task to the blessing and well-being of all whom we know. I ask you, can you think of anything more glorious than living your life as a glorious expression of your union with Christ to the blessing and well-being of all whom you know? Neither can I, and neither can God. Just think of what your life would be like if you did, and just think about what others may experience when with you. We've contemplated God's glorious hope for our lives in Christ, Christ in us, the hope of living glorious lives to the glory of God, blessing all whom we know. Now we will discover God's purpose for our lives in Christ. Having proclaimed God's hope for our lives in Christ, Paul goes on to write this. We proclaim him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we might present every man complete in Christ. And for this purpose also I labor and strive. What was God's eternal purpose for Paul? Motivating Paul to labor and strive to fulfill God's purpose for his life? The same as God's eternal purpose for your lives and mine. Let's unpack Paul's words here to better understand the meaning of Paul's words and what Paul's words mean to our lives. Paul says first, 
that we proclaim Christ. This means that our lives are to proclaim the glory of Christ through all that we are, all that we say, and all that we do. As St. Francis of Assisi remarked, preach the good news of Christ always, and if necessary, use words. Our lives are to be living witnesses to God's glorious will for our lives in Christ to a lost and deceived, a needy, and a watching world. No matter, folks, no matter who's in office, no matter who's running the Senate, our purpose has not changed as God's people. As Paul stated it so well in Philippians 2, he writes, Live out your salvation to its logical conclusion. Don't you know that it's God who lives in you now, giving you his desires, his motives, and his power to carry them out? So prove yourselves to be innocent and blameless children of God, above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in the world, holding forth to them the word of life. Paul then goes, goes on to say this, that we are to admonish every man. The word admonish carries with it the idea of to warn, to counsel, to help awaken somebody to see their need of Christ. I would love to spend some time with you talking about how to engage secular people who believe there is no God to help them see their need of Christ. This is so important in our post-truth culture, but we must move on. We are to proclaim Christ through all that we are, say and do, to help awaken people to see their need of Christ. And Paul then goes on to add this, that we are to teach every man with all wisdom. The idea here is that we are to inform people, to help them understand the truth about Jesus and what Jesus means to their lives. And Paul adds that this must be done with all wisdom. As he goes on to write later in chapter 4, he writes, conduct yourselves with wisdom towards unbelievers. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your speech always be with grace, as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how to respond to each person. This means there is no cookie-cutter approach here. There is no one-size-fits-all. No, we are to ask God for his wisdom to know how to approach and speak to each person about Christ, being sensitive to them and where they are in life. Would you like to pray a prayer that God longs to answer, that God will answer in your life? Try this prayer each day. Good Father, would you send someone into my life today that I, with whom I may share your hope for their lives in Jesus? And Father, would you grant me your wisdom and words for them? We pray here at Oak Hills Church that we would be a church full of God's people who live proclaiming Christ through all that we are, all that we say, and all that we do, helping people to see their need of Christ, informing them of God's truth for their lives in Christ, filled with God's wisdom and words for them. And why? So as Paul writes next, so that we may present every man complete in Christ. Once again, just as the lantern is incomplete without the battery in the lantern to empower the lantern to be all the lantern is meant to be. We as human beings are incomplete without the eternal life of Christ within to enliven our lives with his. Without God's eternal life within us, we are not fully human as God created us to be. The Apostle John stated this so well. At the end of his first letter, he wrote, and the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know 
that you have eternal life. Let me ask another question, please. Do you have, do you have the eternal life of the living Christ living in you to make you whole and complete as a human being God intends for you to be? If you don't, or even if you're not sure, you can right now, wherever you are, by faith, give your life to Christ who first gave his life for you. You can simply say with me, or sometime later in private, Jesus, by faith, I give my life to you to receive you into my life. Thank you for your forgiveness for all my sins and the gift of your indwelling eternal life to make me whole and complete. If you've not done that, I urge you, do not delay, for today can be the day of your salvation. Well, we've learned of God's hope for our lives in Christ and God's purpose for our lives in Christ. Paul then closes with these final words of God's power for our lives in Christ. As he writes, For this purpose also I labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. Once again, don't Paul's final words make you think about the lesson of the lantern? Just as the lantern can only work empowered by the battery in the lantern, Paul says it's only by the power of Christ within him that he works and labors and strives. God's grace is not opposed to effort, only to earning. Paul said this, I've worked harder than any of the other apostles, and yet not I, but God who is at working through me by his grace. This raises a question, doesn't it? This is the big one. How does the Christian life work? How is it lived out? What is God's part? What is my part? Is it my effort or is it God's power? Well, it might, it might be like asking a bird, which wing is more important to flying? Or a pair of scissors, which blade is more important to cutting? St. Augustine said, without us, God will not, and without God, we cannot. Maybe this story might help to illustrate. When my younger son, John, turned eight years old, we got him a brand new bicycle. It was a bigger bicycle and heavier bicycle. And one day, we were out for a ride and a run. He was riding and I was running. And on our final trip back home, we turned the corner and looming before us, was kind of a long and somewhat at the end steep hill. John turned the corner, he, he stood there, got off his bike and stood there and, and I, I said, John, what are you doing? He said, Dad, I'll, I'll never make it. Uh, John didn't know much about physics, but he knew that his little legs with the weight of the bike, the length and steepness of the hill and gravity working against him, he knew his little legs were not going to win. I said, you know, John, Peter would have never have known he could walk on water if he hadn't gotten out of the boat. Why don't you pray to God for strength and get on your bike and start pedaling? Well, John listened to my words, and he responded to them. He got on his bike, and he started pedaling as fast as he could, trying to gain enough momentum to make it up the hill. But at a certain point, the hill was going to win. Gravity's pulling him down. He's slowing down, but without him knowing it, I put my hand behind his bicycle seat and I gave him just enough power to get him to the top of the hill. He overcame the hill. And when we got to the top, I said, John, that was amazing. How did you do it? He said, I don't know, Dad. I just kept pedaling and God gave me the strength. John confessed his inadequacy to make it up the hill on his own. John listened to my words and trusted me. In obedience to my words, John got on his bike and started pendling. And in response to John's faith and obedience, I empowered John to do what John could not do on his own to overcome the hill. John listened to me. John trusted me. John responded to me. And I empowered John to do what he could not do on his own. And the result 
there was victory and joy all the way home. Isn't this how God means for us to live our lives as his beloved sons and daughters? Isn't this how Jesus lived his life while among us? By faith in his Father and obedience to the Father, Jesus lived empowered by his Father to live a life of victory and joy all the way home. And we're here today listening to this because he did. As disciples of Jesus, we're to learn to live as Jesus lived, to become like him for the well-being of others. Jesus calls us to follow him moment by moment, to live lives of faith in him and obedience to him in the all things of life. Let me make just a short comment about a word that no, hardly anybody likes. It's the word obedience. Uh, most of us bristle against the word. We have sort of an allergic reaction to the word. Why? Because it conjures up ideas in our head that obedience is like being in subjugation under somebody's thumb who's going to control us. Let us eliminate all those false notions about obedience. What if faith is reaching out to open the door to God and obedience is walking through the door to experience God and his power for our lives? <laughs> obedience, what a beautiful word. It was for Jesus and it is for us. How does the Christian life work? By faith we abide in Christ abiding in us who prompts us with his thoughts, his ideas, through his spirit and his written word. In obedience, we respond to him to live Christ-empowered lives for the well-being of others, leading others to him. And the result? Victory and joy all the way to our eternal home. So we're going to close out our time together today by declaring God's glorious will for our lives in Christ as our mission and vision statements render it here at Oak Hills Church. And let's do this together out loud and let's do it in the first person. Are you ready? Are you ready? Here we go. I am a disciple of Jesus who makes disciples by guiding all people to follow Jesus moment by moment. I am a disciple of Jesus who courageously engages others with God's hope for their lives in Jesus where I live, work, learn, and play. Now, go be to the people in your world today what Jesus was to the people in his world then through the power of his presence within. May Christ enliven your lives with his so others experience something wonderful of him when with you. Amen. Amen. We are going to enter into a time of prayer and reflection. And I just want to ask you a few questions. Where are you in need of God's hope for your life? Or, or maybe you're, you watch this and, and maybe you're going, Man, I, I need to know God's purpose for my life. Or maybe there's some of you who just watched this message and you're going, I don't have any strength. I don't have any power. I need God's power in my life right now. As we enter into this time of reflective prayer, I, I would love for you just to take 30 seconds, 20 to 30 seconds, and just reflect on where you need Jesus most right now in your life. Are you needing hope? Are you needing to know God's will and purpose for your life? Are you needing his power in your life? Take a moment and reflect on that right now. Father, we come before you today 
God, thanking you that you are that source. God, you are that hope that we need. God, you are the purpose for our lives. God, and you are the ultimate source. God, you are the ultimate power and strength that we need to get through each and every day. And God, we don't have to go to a different source to find that. We go to the one true source, and that's found in none, none other than the person of Jesus. So God, for all of my friends and family that are watching, God, would you be what it is they need you to be right now? God, would you be the hope in their life? Would you be the hope in their family? God, would you be the hope for them that they need in their jobs and in their relationships? God, would you give them the purpose, Lord, to continue to get up every single day? God, and live as lights for you, for your glory, and for your honor. And God, would you be the source of strength and power, God, that we need to live out each and every day following you as a disciple. God, moment by moment. God, would you give us the courage? God, would you give us the grace to engage our world with the hope of Jesus? God, wherever we go, and wherever we are. So Jesus, we love you. God, and we thank you for this time. We thank you for this message of hope that you've laid on our church, that you've laid on our hearts. And God, we respond to you with a resounding yes. We will follow you. We will be disciples who make disciples by guiding all people to follow you every moment of every day. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, at this time, we are going to enter back into a time of worship. And in just a few moments, we are going to participate in communion. And in a moment, Wes is going to lead us in, in taking communion. So if you would prepare your elements, prepare your, your juice and crackers. And in just a moment, Wes will lead us in a time of communion.
We that believe Jesus died for us, and we asked him into our lives to live in us and through us. That's why we take these elements at this time, to remember his sacrifice and the hope that he gives. So we take the bread that represents his body. represents his blood shed for us. Church, can you just join me in declaring this over your life? Can you say, Jesus Christ, you are our living hope. Lord, send your spirit that we might overflow with hope each and every day. And across the camera, can you just say amen? Amen. Amen. Are you looking for a do-over in 2021? Did you know that the gospel offers us the best second chance any time of the year? And with the hope of Jesus comes the ultimate do-over. And so if you could use a do-over going into 2021, or, or maybe simply you just need to be encouraged with a gospel-centered message as you start 2021, then be sure that you join us next week in January 2nd and 3rd. We have a great year ahead as the body of Christ as we continue to walk in God's calling for us to be a community of disciples, courageously engaging culture with the hope of Jesus where we live, work, learn, and play. Well, church, may you go and may you be strengthened in the grace that is only found in Christ Jesus. Have a happy new year, Oak Hills Church family. God bless you. to live the love you've shown to the people who